a cricketing view an irregular podcast about cricket and other things in this episode of the podcast i speak to karunya keshav and snehal pradhan karunya is editor at large at wisden india and the author of the fire burns blue a history of women's cricket in india snehal pradhan is a former india fast bowler since retirement she works as a freelance sports journalist and broadcaster and has written for crick info first post the economic times scroll dot in among others she is also a prolific youtuber her cricket with snehal series is designed to share lessons learned over a 15 year playing career first of all welcome snehal thank you for having me once again and welcome karunya it's it's wonderful to talk to you thanks for having me snehal uh can you give us a little bit of a background about how this came about i think it uh, i think both karan and you will agree that uh, it needed a crazy person and uh, to set this rolling and that crazy person was siddhant and um, karan and siddhant and myself were the only three indian media who were in england for the women's women's world cup 2017 um after that uh, after that world cup Siddhant and me uh, prepared a very brief, very raw document on you know what we thought would be a few recommendations to take women's cricket forward because suddenly there was momentum out of nowhere, um, and it was uh, it, we thought that we should put forward something that might help take advantage of this opportunity, and we prepared a very um, rudimentary document. uh covering a lot of important areas with some important and some common sense suggestions we submitted it to uh, the bcci and a few people within the community um i think about a year or uh about a year after that so probably in 2019 uh, siddhant had a conversation with uh, nandan kamath of the sports law and policy center and nandan suggested why don't you to put it together in the form of a formal more formal report which can be published and then that can be used to start conversations um so we took up the project uh, started working on it unfortunately siddhant's health deteriorated after that and i was struggling after uh, his passing to do it alone so i asked karunya for help and she uh, very happily and very graciously came on board um and then the last 6 months have been kind of this stop start process in which we tried to uh do uh this alongside our regular work uh lockdown probably gave us an opportunity to get some concrete work done in uh, with regard to this report and we finally sent it across to uh, sports law policy center they helped us a lot with the refining process and finally put it out in time for their symposium 2020 wonderful um karunya you come at this from a different side to snehal snehal used to play for india and played for maharashtra and uh, has a has a long uh, association with commentary and you know writing about cricket uh, and you you've been a journalist and you you're now editor at large at wisden india and you covered women's cricket so can you tell us about your uh, involvement in this project and your background um yeah uh i i think snehal hasn't told you the full story at the day after at the evening of the world cup final in 2017 i saw how devastated pretty much both siddhanta and snehal were and the question was what w- I mean, it was a matter of about nine runs that india lost by so the question that we right. kept asking was you know what is this this marginal difference that meant england were the ones who won then and not india and how can this you know the small difference be actually uh, surpassed and uh, after that final as snehal mentioned there was a lot of momentum and we did get a lot of um, uh, a lot of interest in from from publishers to write this book and the book itself which uh, the fire burns blue was the product of about 5 years of work before that so yeah. along with siddhanta um, i and maybe a couple of other people at wisden india were involved in writing about women's cricket in following women's cricket and i think by around 2017 we were at a position not only to talk about things like do we need the ipl or you know uh, uh, who is mithali raj we we had sort of 
our understanding of the game and the situation and the environment had gone a little beyond that. So we were in a situation um, after that to to sort of go a little deeper into the ecosystem and really understand uh, what are the blocks that it takes to build women's cricket. And I think my interest, uh, I wouldn't say is academic, but uh, yeah, I do come from, uh, my interest is mostly about the social aspects mm. of females playing sports. And uh, this report was a good chance to sort of bring the two things together. There's a, there's always this tendency, and I think you guys are familiar with it. So, so use men's the men's game as a sort of a benchmark for women for the women's game to aspire to. And this is true not just in cricket but also in other sports. I think I think one of the interesting things in your report I found is that it deals with women the women's game on its own terms as its own thing and in its own way without sort of seeking to aspire to what the men have achieved or what, what, where the men's game is. But there's going to be pressure to constantly look at where the men are and what they have achieved and, and you know, how popular and deeply rooted the men's game is in India uh, when, when discussing the women's game. How do you see this relationship? Um, one of the challenges has always been changing the narrative from... Um, a comparison to men's cricket to yeah. uh, seeing it in its own lights and yeah. throughout our uh, writing and whenever uh, we have the chance to speak about the game we have emphasized that approach even when we made our presentation of the report at the SLPC symposium one of the themes was uh, equal but different um, yeah. and this is a concept that's being talked about a lot in the current uh, social uh, situation with the whole Black Lives Matter thing and about what is the difference between equality and equity and etc. But it's uh, in a way um, we want the same objectives as the men's game. That is, we want to have uh, a team that has won multiple World Cups. We want an ecosystem that is producing the best cricketers. But uh, you can't copy paste the systems that have succeeded for men's cricket and just say, okay, we've done it for women's cricket be happy it has to be a very it has to be a tailor-made approach it's 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 exactly like uh, giving the women's cricketers men's kit to wear and just hoping that they'll you know just wear one size lower and it should fit well which is exactly what happens yeah. uh, most kit suppliers don't make separate women's uh, kit for uh, Indian cricket team at least but oh. then it's not going to be a perfect fit so there are going to be points of difference and which is why I suppose it's very important that the decision makers are aware of this difference and willing to uh, implement things differently or that the decision makers come from the women's cricket ecosystem such that uh, they are aware that you need a different approach. Karunya, how do you see this association and this, you know, this sibling relationship, you know, because it could be argued that the men's game and the, the men's cricket scene in India is not particularly healthy either, you know, in that, you know, it, there, there isn't sort of a, a, a widespread adult recreational cricket scene in India, you know, the, in the way that there is in, say, certain parts of the UK and certain parts of, the, of, of Australia. Yeah, I mean, it's, inev in, it's inevitable that there will be some comparisons and association with the men's game. And I think what we try to say with the report that some of this is good. Um, just to yeah. give you an example, a few years ago, it was considered to be a good idea for women's games to happen on the same day as the men's as double headers. Yeah. Um, uh, this was tried with a lot of games, especially T20Is, and the thinking was that people will come to the women's game, and uh, I mean, people will come to the men's game a little early, and when they're yeah. in, they'll see that women also play the women uh, play cricket, and be interested or attracted to it, and then maybe watch it on TV or something the next time. Now, in the past year or even a couple of years, there's an understanding that this doesn't work anymore. It worked four years ago but it doesn't work anymore yeah. simply because women the women's game is strong enough as a product 
and this association with the men's game was actually hurting it you can easily get maybe 4000 8000 uh, people to watch women's game we saw in the world t20 world cup uh, final in australia a few months ago that 86000 people came yeah um and given this and given the potential which has now been recognized to tie it with the men's game is harmful so what the show says this is changing so there yeah. may still be some elements in which the women's game benefits from its association with the men's game uh and some way you need to look at it separately for the most i think with our report what we're seeing is for the most part you need to look at it separately but things like the ipl for example the ipl that we have suggested rather than how it is right now as the women's t20 challenge where the teams uh, you know there is new teams like supernova or uh, trail blazers and things like that um it's helpful to have maybe a women's mumbai indian team yeah. or a women's rajasthan royal team where they can um exist in the same sort of ecosystem benefit from the same resources uh and the fan bases so i think it's not as easy as saying completely split it but the point is it can't be an add on even right. if the decision is made to to associate it with the men's game it needs to be on the basis of what is good for the women's game uh and that sort of governance that sort of administration needs to be in place uh, that that sort of understanding of the market needs to be in place to enable this um your point about the recreational game uh i'm honestly i'm not i'm not so sure that that's true i think there is a fair bit of um there's a fair lot of opportunity for men to play uh, yeah. cricket even when they know that they're not going to make it to their state team or their uh, or the national team i mean there is club cricket there is uh, corporate yeah. cricket lots of offices are able to uh, play cricket um actually siddhanta's sister was telling me some time ago about how she was trying to organize a cricket tournament in her office and it was so difficult for her to get enough girls and women to play yeah. um you know there were various fears about whether people would get injured and things like that so mm. um and the the other issue with women playing cricket for fun actually there's less opportunity for them to do that than the men simply yeah. because after a point of, for women you either you go for trials you maybe get selected for your state team uh, if you're good enough you get selected for the national team but there's no almost no in between there's there's no uh, for younger people there's no college or university cricket for slightly older people there's no club cricket so after 26 if you're not part of um a, a state team or something you probably just quit the game yeah. so this element of fun of playing cricket for fun is probably yes. drastically less for the women the men's game is seems to be held up as a benchmark of merit whereas it seems to me and it has always seemed to me that it is really a benchmark of power isn't it i mean that the, the idea that men get to play cricket for leisure men in their 40s and 50s get to play cricket for leisure is is a function of their power they have that free time and 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 it is accepted that they should have that free time it's not clear that that would be accepted for women in their 40s and 50s and and similarly i mean there seems to be all, in every story i hear about the women's game there seems to be a the only real aspiration seems to be oh you should there's a chance that you could play for india or you know there's a chance that you could make a living here but that's not why most boys play cricket right they play it because it's fun you know and and that fun and 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 in and they don't even play with like a proper cricket ball or gloves or pads or on a proper turf wicket or anything like that they play in their colony and they play in the school playground or whatever it is you know and that's fun and that is the real sort of grassroots where you know there's a there's a critical mass of interest in the game and the, the critical mass of the game exists at that level for boys i mean i i can understand the sort of the the impulse to sort of try and create the the top level game and then try to so to see that okay people will see that and then they will play and then that will get people to play for 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 fun and and you you guys make the very important point about facilities and 
infrastructure and the idea that schools should probably start having girls teams and age group teams for girls and you also talk about the pluses and minuses of mixed cricket so could you elaborate on those things uh, i completely agree that this is probably the biggest hole in india's um, cricket ecosystem for mm-hmm. women in that uh, there isn't a robust school cricket presence there is uh, to a smaller extent a university cricket uh, uh, presence i remember uh, playing university cricket and quite competitive university cricket uh, yeah. in my uh, college days yeah uh, but as far as school goes it's most likely situations where you are the only girl uh, practicing in a boys team because you're just that crazy and yeah. if you're lucky you can actually play in the tournaments that the boys are playing in yeah um as far as the leisure angle goes it's true that um, i suppose the concept of leisure uh, as defined by western societies yeah. doesn't really exist in india for men or for women um it's not something which is counted it's not something which is uh measured it's not something which is probably acknowledged people just get bored and therefore they move towards a leisure activity it's not recognized as a necessity in um a full life in a satisfying life mm. it's just something people do on the weekends and uh social norms around um typical roles that women take at a particular age uh, yeah. also do dictate that sports is probably not one of those activities unless it means driving your kids to and fro the ground now yeah. something interesting that um, i interviewed um, vrinda rathi recently who used to be a scorer uh, yeah. with the mumbai cricket association moved on into umpiring and is now in the icc development panel yeah she told me that they are encouraging these moms who bring their kids to uh, training and then they just sit there for 3 hours they are encouraging them to get involved they are encouraging them to become scorers they are encouraging them to become volunteers and uh, double up with whatever duties need need to be done so in small pockets there is this culture of cricket for women expanding beyond just that age of uh, 25 or below but it is uh, probably only in certain pockets where grassroots women's cricket is better developed i mean mumbai is one of the examples because they have a large number of women scorers they have a good inter school uh, tournament running up to a couple of years ago right. um they have uh, pretty good they the one of the few states who conducted under 16 age group matches even before the bcci put under 16 age group together so where there is a proactive interest you will see cricket moving beyond this uh, age group of just uh 25 and into uh older women who do it for leisure because it's something they enjoy but uh, right now cricket is very much a game played by students and young women and there is a huge gap in terms of the uh, inter school structure all over india um for a bulk of those students your report makes the point about you know even sort of basic infrastructure like change rooms and changing facilities and questions of you know when when it comes to mixed cricket which was uh, which which i think is sort of seems to me to be somewhat related to this question of you know at what age you know does a what is the age mix of the mixed cricket which which would sort of pre- maintain that competitive balance right uh, so for instance you could have maybe you know high, girls in high school playing with boys who are like i don't know under 12s or under 14s or whatever it is and i could be completely wrong wait high school is what seventh standard is what 10 age 12 right age 12 or yeah. 13 yeah 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 <laughs> something like that so uh, because i know you were telling me snehal about uh, playing with uh, under 16s when you were in college and yeah. that 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 seemed to be a good fit for you right yeah under 16s just the boys were just getting into under 19s uh, yeah. even in my early 20s even in my late 20s i played with uh, boys of this age group because um, it seemed to be a good fit physically once you get once boys get closer to 18 19 then the pace just gets uh, to a point which you don't get in the women's game so there's no point really 
playing with them uh, on such a regular basis from a batting point of view yeah um but the bigger question of you know mixed cricket is something that karun and me debated a little bit because yeah. um i think it's easy to say it's it's a good thing for mixed cricket to happen but yeah. i think it's important my personal opinion is it's important to stress for all girls cricket at a certain age especially in that school age yeah because if you don't stress on it then they won't form girls teams and they'll just let the few girls who are interested play as mixed cricket which is yeah. almost how i've grown up and i think karunya might have uh, uh, another view on this which is that there are a lot of advantages to that mixed cricket i i think the thing we sort of came to a consensus about is that there needs to be a choice so yeah. there's definitely a benefit for mixed cricket um yeah. as, in terms of skills there is yeah. also the fact that you know we're not separating girls and boys it's a good thing the girls feel they can be part of the boys team um and you know if you have only five girls in your area in your academy who are playing cricket it makes sense for them to join with you know put in a few more boys there and make a team and play cricket but but, but then again there needs to be this choice so if there are girls who want to play only girls teams who are not comfortable with maybe playing with the boys either due to society which is a fact and it may yeah. be a fact that a lot of uh, parents aren't comfortable with uh, with their girls playing with boys not only because of stereotypes and all of that but also from a from a safety point of view whether they'll be safe and uh, there's a story that we have in the report itself about even someone like Jamima who played with the boys who said it was a little difficult for her to strike up a friendship strike up conversations with the boys so yeah. so you know there is that divide but the important thing is that there's choice so yeah. um, and it's up to the maybe to a certain extent it's also up to the girls you know involve them ask them what can you do uh, again it, it it's this is definitely not something that is one size fits all so it also is up to maybe the clubs to maybe come to an understanding between themselves say can you can you join two academies or two clubs to come up with a bigger team uh is um, is it possible that you need to go door to door uh, getting girls involved all of that i mean all of that is part of this conversation so um yeah bottom line it's it's good for girls to have that choice and uh, whatever makes them feel most confident and most secure um to play cricket one of the arguments you keep hearing uh snehal is this argument about demand if there is demand the girls team will happen and so on and and that that seems to me to perhaps be backwards right i mean you have to create the the facility for the for the girls team and then see within like 3 4 years that you know increasing number of girls will participate in it if the opportunity is there you know if the if the if if there is a place someone will come and occupy it if they are interested right i mean that that mm-hmm. that seems to me to be a much more sustainable way of growing the game rather than you know waiting for there to be demand and being then being dragged into sort of creating some half assed tournament which is i think what basically has happened at the at the top level of the women's game right but there is demand i mean yeah. um since 2017 since that visibility was created Uh, yeah. there have been so many uh, grassroots coaches who run academies tell me that you know the number of inquiries for their girls for girls to play cricket the number yeah. of people asking can i bring my daughter as well as my son has yeah. just gone up like like anything i don't agree uh, to the people who say that there isn't demand uh, yeah. i think once you once you give uh, the top level of cricket visibility and it's that uh, you can't be what you can't see wala funda and if you can see it then you want to be it so as soon yeah. as you give visibility to the indian women's team as soon as they capture imaginations by winning uh, uh, tough games close games uh, by putting in great performances you are going to have demand for people to want to bowl like vipti sharma and bat like harmanpreet kaur yeah so the demand is there already because uh, the women's team has been consistently on television for the last 3 years yeah so it's just now a matter of putting in the framework 
to uh, cater to that demand i mean we have talent coming from places like shadow in madhya pradesh yeah yeah and if that's not demand i don't know what is for most of the 20th century cricket in india was a metropolitan game and it, even with that the the sort of the national team was of a very high standard and since they have ex- they have sort of figured out ways to uh, scout talent and look for talent beyond the metropolitan uh, centers in in a systematic sustained way you know the talent pool now is extraordinary compared to what it was 25 years ago let's say in the men's game correct yeah yeah but i mean it, there's no reason to think that would not also be the case in the women's game right yeah absolutely um you know just because there is this demand there's that's absolutely no reason for administrators to just sit back and say girls will come and will make a team no it means like how, what kind of teams are you going to make what um, age group teams are you going to make the scouting system is non pretty much non existent in women's cricket it's like if you if there's a cricketer a, you know some somewhat big name cricketer from your district you maybe get picked up um so both need to go hand in hand you can't just say that okay there's enough demand so we're not going to put in the work um i think there are some interesting uh plans from other sports also where you know you sort of identify girls who are good in other sports and try to bring them onto cricket this is right. something that the administrators need to need to do you know all those height challenges or like find girls to play softball and bring them in i mean the indian cricket team in the mid 70s was pretty much formed by this by people just going and finding girls who had some sort of athletic ability and say okay come play cricket so yeah. um, we've obviously come a long way from then but um, that doesn't mean that a more systemized uh, process can't be followed in making sure that girls do look at cricket as something that they want to do there are other sports in india where the gap between sort of the men's and the women's side of the sport is not as large as it was in cricket say in the early 2000s let's say is there something that cricket can learn from other sports in india for example with badminton and things like that they seem to be doing really well isn't it i don't know i think badminton might be slightly different what we Right. Again, I don't have the numbers for this, but based on what people have said, uh, in the subcontinent, parents are more comfortable sending their children to indoor sports, and right. which is why badminton sort of benefits. Um, also, the fact that India did win Olympics and uh, and yeah. winning a big tournament does give such a massive boost to the sport. I'm yeah. sure I'm, the boost that the Indi- that Indian women's cricket is riding is pretty much again because of their performance in the World Cup. I'm sure the minute they actually win a tournament, it's again going to take uh, another step up. Yeah. I'm not able to say too much about the administration and the governance because I think every sport seems to have its own uh, issues. The only thing about mad- badminton is that there is more. uh i may be completely mistaken here but it there seems to be more private uh investment in it yeah. and cricket that is in there because the bcci is such a um a strong body and in to an extent it is a reasonably well run sports body in india um, so 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 compared to badminton yeah i think that may be it so that's two things essentially the fact that socially badminton is looked at as something more uh, uh something that's more okay for women and also in terms of this other academy support um the the that badminton has now of course there's the example of you know world champions and world number ones and 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 that that as you say must go really far uh which which sort of brings me to a conversation i've had with sneha before about the women's ipl Sehal do you favor the idea that existing IPL teams should build their own uh build sort of women's teams at adjacent to men's teams because that sort of seems to be where your report is going uh or do you think there's a 
there's an opportunity given the new fond popularity of women's sports to to build a independent separate women's league um, um i think 100% the existing ipl franchises should uh start women's teams of their own what is important is for those teams to be as important to them as their men's teams are even though they may not contribute to uh, a bottom line straight away but, but there are so many uh, delayed uh, benefits there are so many long term benefits there are so many intangible benefits that they can have i mean just thinking as a corporation you can tap into a population uh, tap into a market segment which is probably been unexplored you can have the additional brand uh, value of having someone like a smriti mandana or for mumbai indians or a um, julan goswami for kolkata night riders so this is strong uh, geographic connection with certain players which can be uh, which can work in their favor and most importantly from the game point of view yeah. it's a model that has been proven in uh, other countries for example uh, in the us it's a different model where the wnba is quite different has different teams as compared to the nba um, and australia have tried something different with the women's big bash and that has been replicated by the women's afl where right. you have the same you have the same franchise and basically yeah. two teams one brand or two teams one name and that that concept has been adopted brilliantly by australia partly because uh, the the teams are owned by cricket australia by the governing body not by private bodies so it's much easier for that uh, ethos to flow from the top down into all uh, big bash teams but it has shown such great dividends in terms of the crossover of fan loyalty the crossover mm. of uh, skills and uh, the athletic exposure that each can provide to the other yeah. uh, the very fact that there is uh, the facilities which uh, i mean ipl teams complain all the time that you know they have staff on their full time payroll who yeah. are only working or who have big gaps in their calendar and those calendar yeah. gaps can be then devoted to women's teams and ipl teams will be pretty happy with that so the yeah. synergy is just obvious it just has yeah. to be done it, there has to be respect from whichever um franchise or with whoever takes it up whether it's the same or whether it's different there has to be a lot of commitment to where uh, they want to take their women's programs because that would be a unique experience given that you know in the on the men's side the IPL basically completely relied on the vast infrastructure of the BCCI on the men's side but there isn't sort of a comparable comparably large infrastructure on the women's side so that may be an opportunity for the the IPL franchises to actually branch out on their own a little bit as well absolutely i mean there are these teams who, who see so much potential but yeah. <clears throat> the fact is that um, the lead has to come from uh, the governing body and whatever terms they set is the terms that uh, any franchise will follow i mean there are already franchises who have made foray into women's programs with inter school or developing age group teams uh they have these programs for both boys and girls mumbai indians yeah. are running an inter school tournament for boys and girls yeah. uh, in mumbai pune nagpur rajasthan yeah. royals are doing it in jaipur so yeah. they obviously see it and uh they see the potential yeah and is it's just a win win in yeah. um, any way you look at it as long as it's approached uh with a very long term vision in mind and with a great respect for uh these women athletes karunya are, are there any outstanding uh, legislative hurdles to any of this stuff the usual conversations that happen around funding uh, is doesn't really come into cricket as much i think when you talk about funding for various sports especially yeah. those that are dependent on the government there are always these uh, attempts to sort of find new ways whether by csr or um you know how uk has this whole lottery scheme i think yeah. even in all of that cricket is is a way from it given how successful the bcci has been yeah. and i think there is a sort of uh, independence to it the legislation yeah. i think uh, yeah there is that sports bill so it's a lot to do with the administration maybe in terms of uh, ensuring that there are enough 
women in governance, um, ensuring that there's a players association that can yeah. can that can promote the welfare of uh, you know this massive community that you have. Um, maybe even you know it, it's mostly on the labor laws angle that it comes in. Um, the Loda report did try to do this. Obviously, you, you know we know that's in a bit of a uh, bit of a confusion right now. Or not everything has been implemented and things like that. So, um, so yeah, I guess a general sports bill, which I think is long-standing, and all the issues that we talk about with sports legislation, including things like uh, match fixing. Honestly, the, uh, we've seen recently that. Uh, Apparently, women's sports and associate nation cricket, um, they're more supposedly more open to match fixing now because they're on TV more. Um, so, yeah, so in general, the, a better sports ecosystem for which you do need legislation will obviously benefit uh, women's cricket as well. And especially in terms of um, the, more, you know, the labor laws uh, that help define working conditions in the best way for the players. Yeah, because I think one of the interesting sections in your in the report has to do with you know workplace harassment and work you know protections for uh, for 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 women, for girls from you know you know bad behavior by coaches and stuff, and and there has to be sort of some some framework within which. The protections can be sort of guaranteed and can be seen to be there, and can be seen to exist, isn't it? I mean, because yeah. the relationship between a coach and a and a and a ward is a, is the coach is in a workplace, isn't it? I mean, that's it, that shouldn't be in dispute. Yeah, I really like your use of the word workplace. I think this is something that came up a lot uh, when Snehal and I were discussing this as well. That uh, what do we want a helpful workplace to look like? For these women who play cricket, how can yeah. we treat it as work that respects them, that keeps them safe? And uh, workplace harassment is obviously a massive part of it. Um, yeah. Just access to resources, uh, being treated as equal, all of it comes into it as well. Um, the economic aspect of it and the post-career aspects of it, maternity benefits, pregnancy benefits, uh, what happens if they take a year off to have a baby. I think all of that is part of this larger conversation about uh, making cricket, looking at cricket almost as a workplace for these women. Um, and yeah, sexual harassment is a massive part of it. Harassment is not just sort of, you know, some man behaving horribly. It's also sort of much more subtle things like, you know, uh, a, a boss who's hostile to a, a female employee's, you know, aspirations to play sport or, or something like that, you know, where, you know, the whole the whole question of pay is a is a is an issue of harassment, right? I mean, the people say that you know, well, women shouldn't make enough money, uh, a, the the same money as the men because they don't sort of generate produce enough money as men. Now that in the case of like say the Indian national cricket team is perhaps true but the argument for paying men more has never been that they are better at their work it has always been that you know they have to provide for the family and they are the head of the household you know that's, that's not a meritocratic argument that's an argument about position when this question of equal pay comes up people say well it's because women don't produce enough profits I, this is i think it's a big argument that we've made in the report itself that yeah. you can't talk about equal pay without acknowledging the fact that this that the reason for this inequality is the product of discrimination for years yeah. so this women's cricket you're talking about something that has been in um, existence in some form for the last maybe three four decades um, men's cricket goes back way longer you've put in so much money into your men's cricket you put, you've marketed them you've uh, gone out to find sponsors for them you you've uh, put them on television with all these fancy cameras and given them drs and this that and the other there was a really interesting uh, thread that chikka pande uh, who's yes, part of the indian women's team yeah th this is what she I put out it. that that you know we're just in a different place um 
and, and to say that you know you can't pay the women as much as the men as you pay the men simply because they don't bring in that much revenue the the uh, immediately of turning the uh, putting the burden on this on the on the players it's it's not their fault that you haven't invested in them for the past 3 4 decades uh it's up to the administrators to bring in those people to the stadiums to bring in the sponsors to bring in that marketing to say that we are not going to pay you more or we are not going to treat you as equal uh members of this ecosystem because you don't bring in as much money is more the fault of the administration um and maybe even to an extent social discrimination for so many years than yeah. putting than putting the burden on the players i'm pretty active on twitter you know i i sort of observe cricket twitter a lot and this is the most common argument i've seen about women's cricket a lot of people are now even be prepared to accept the proposition that women's cricket is different and it has to be viewed on its own terms but on the money it is a widespread it seems to me to be a widespread view that people say well you know a million people will not come to watch harman preet kaur why should she get paid the same as you know virat kohli uh, to you know to play a one day international why should her match fees be the same as not be the uh, be the same as kohli you know and and this is a this is a this is an argument which has to be tackled head on i think so i think the i think that part of your uh, of your report is 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 important and hopefully i think that part of the report will get a lot of attention snehal i want to come to a subject which you know unless i misread the report is has always had, and, and 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 it's a subject which has bugged me a lot over the years in general which is the question of you know college sports and university sports you know uh-huh. which which has generally sh- seems to have shrunk even on the men's side uh because you know ba- playing for bombay university used to be a big deal back in the 60s mm. and the 70s and the, even the 80s and and now it's not is there a is there an opening on the women's side for that um one of the challenges that we had through our facing this report is uh, a lack of data and yes. university cricket and i mean typically how it works in india is a university rather than um Uh, i'm not exactly sure how it works in established academic competitions like in the us whether it's yeah. a college or a university but university cricket has a certain amount of pride and it had a certain amount of pride when i was playing for sure yeah. Yeah. uh this of course is 15 years ago yeah. almost yeah. so it's been hard to get a sense of where it is now one thing is the trend we've seen in men's cricket is that since cricket takes up so much more of your time you yeah. go and are involved in the college ecosystem and your university much less it's very likely a token admission uh, and you appear for your exams externally as we say which is you don't attend your lectures and you just appear for exams so and that sometimes works for sports people because then it allows them to play it allows them to then focus on their sport which they're trying to turn professional uh, for the boys and then still allows them to uh, turn out for your university uh, team and get your degree at the end yeah slowly Correct. we are seeing the women's cricket season expand there is more time going towards um, cricket and less towards your academics but yeah. it's not to the point yet where it will completely overtake it so there is a big opportunity i think there is already um, inter university competitions are already established i'm not sure how consistently they've been running for women's cricket in the last decade or so but if they have uh, that is definitely an opportunity that needs to be uh, explored further the value of playing for your university needs to be explored further I'll, one point illustrates the value of your university is that a medal in a inter university competition is counted towards employment opportunities in yeah. uh, the railways yes so that is something very valuable for um, and that one that uh, that medal was one of the things that helped me get a job with western railway so that is something that definitely needs to be given a lot of lot more value than it is being given right now karunya do you think that there's a there's a case for repeating this type of report every 2 years let's say because i know you you published the questionnaire uh, which you conducted which formed the basis of a lot of the findings in the report 
uh, and do you think it's worth repeating the questionnaire every two years to see how progress is being made and is there any plan to keep this as an ongoing sort of review of the state of the art um, as nehal mentioned data was the biggest stumbling block for us so um, if every two years there's a proper system in place to be able to do a, a really strong survey with proper sampling um, yeah. you know able to reach the most number of people adjusted by age uh, and location mm-hmm. all of that would be absolutely great i think we'll get a much better understanding of a lot of things if we do yeah. that yeah. um in general i suppose any any report like this or actually any work in sport um and that's something that we've spoken about in our report as well you do need to set sort of timelines and um ensure some sort of accountability so it would be nice obviously to see in two years how much of this has changed um yeah. a, a lot of this change might even happen from external sources so you may have sponsors suddenly deciding that they want to do more with women's cricket we've already yeah. seen this happening in the us as well with you know nike and the png sort of yeah putting their money where their mouth is and 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 i, I think even working in women's sport the last two years we've been struck by how quickly this change has happened um so so yeah i'm sure in two years it will be a completely different set of questions that are raised and issues that come up so it would be lovely to to keep this going and the plan is of course i mean this is a long term plan this is something that we hope to have as a framework for the next maybe 5 to 7 years even so uh, so yeah so both of you are involved in in both journalism and as well as you know this larger policy question now uh what do you think is the role for you know the commentariat on on in in this area so one of the um one of the new challenges now i mean for the last 6 months we've been focused on just getting this done one of hmm. the new challenges is keeping the conversation going yeah and that requires uh, a lot of uh, support a lot of participation from i mean this report is one of one of the approaches was for it to not be limited to you know the bcci and the cricket uh, state associations and their ambit and their purview it's also about what other stakeholders can do broadcasters private uh, sponsors just event organizers and media yeah so the role of the media in continuing the conversation uh, cannot be understated for we, we're trying to put out um, as much relevant content to the report as possible trying to create conversations around uh, maybe a central hashtag like the an equal you or equal you and just get a lot of people involved in this conversation of what they want women's cricket in india to look like because there are parents of young cricketers there are coaches who uh, train young girls probably yeah. for the first time in their life there are uh, kit manufacturers who for the first time are thinking oh should i m- make a separate size chart for women so the raising of all these questions and the exploration of all these angles is what i hope that other people in the media will uh, and other people who just obsessively write about cricket will really take up and really um, embrace because that is something that it cannot stop here and it cannot be done alone and i think it is a cause that is very dear to not just our hearts but so many other hearts so yes. if those hearts also uh, use whatever platforms they have and the voices that they have to amplify these conversations i think it will come to a point where the decision makers definitely will have to take notice karunya Yeah, just to add to this, um, for general fans, uh, personally, I get very annoyed when someone, uh, you know, gets a chance to speak to a female cricketer and then asks, "Who is your favorite male player?" Yeah. I think the <laughs> understanding has to come uh, by saying, "Okay, we actually need to listen to what this person says, and and not sort of impose 
our preconceived notions of what cricket should be and what the cricket i'm used to looks like on these women who are playing a game and are telling you that they're playing a slightly different game um so it's just about listening to them making spaces for more women to play um understanding that okay if you have girls coming and playing in your academy well just don't make fun of them um i'm not saying this happens often or anything but just that sort of sensitivity to the fact that they're different the different requirements for women who play who decide to play cricket and uh, uh cri- uh women who want to be who want to talk about cricket women who want to uh, be a part of administration just just i think in all areas if we can just make a little more space for women who are in cricket that would be nice well i think women's cricket is is here as a exciting new sport distinct from men's cricket it has its own points of interest and its own points of contestation and it is here to stay and it is going to grow and the question for all of us really is you know which side of the fence are we going to be on you know are we going to be on the side of the fence which helps it grow or are we going to be on sitting around you know pretending that women are not good enough or as good as the men at cricket it's up to it's up to the listener i think um thank you to both of you for firstly for the report and secondly for coming on the podcast and uh, you know thank you also to the memory of siddhant patnaik who has been uh, a champion of this this cause for who was a champion of this cause for his working during his working life i'd like to give each of you the last word so um snehal would you like to go first i think I, i'd really uh, reemphasize the point that uh, some of these cricketers who played for india who are currently playing for india right now are my friends i've seen how hard they worked i've seen um how them and us at the time have not always gotten um the kind of treatment that uh, we've deserved and that they deserved and i want nothing more than for them to have the respect that uh, they deserve and i think that's that's the central theme of uh, this report and essentially has been of uh, the reason i got into media and my work so that's all i would probably hope for listeners to take home and thank you for having me on this podcast karunya the thing about women's cricket is that i personally found that uh, it's a very positive space to be in even though a lot of the stories you heard you heard are about you know people struggling and people being discriminated against and things like that this keeping all that aside there's so much positivity because there's so much passion involved in the sport and it's a lovely community to be part of um this is a community that always has space for more people so anyone who wants to get involved in the conversations around women's cricket i think they find people who are willing to engage and willing to listen so yeah so come on in and um speaking about the report itself yeah, those who have had a chance to read it if they have any questions or if they have any suggestions or um anything that they feel need looking at again uh, you know we're open to hearing about it we're open to talking about it so so any responses are welcome If listeners would like to get in touch with Karunya Keshav or Snehal Pradhan, uh, Karunya tweets at K U K S on Twitter, and Snehal Pradhan tweets at Snehal Pradhan on Twitter. This was my conversation with Karunya Keshav, editor at large for Wisden India, and Snehal Pradhan, former India fast bowler, about their report, An Equal Hue: A Way Forward for the Women in Blue. This concludes this episode.